Were we messing with the indigenous beliefs of Germans with the Nuremberg trials? And you know, the thing about relativism in a debate is that if I debate a relativist and I lose the debate, according to the judges, that proves that I win. Because what does a winner or a loser in a debate mean? So really, if I lose, I win. If my opponent could win, if my opponent were a relativist, if they could win, it would undermine their worldview and thus validate my worldview. This shows again how contradictory and wrong this view is. Now, I could be wrong about where to draw the line on some of these black and white issues, on certain moral issues, but right now I'm just insisting in this relativist debate that there is in fact a line that exists and that we need to talk about it. I mean, if there were no line, then Mother Teresa just produced stuff and Osama bin Laden just produced stuff, but we can't really say whether the moral nature of their lives were good or bad. Uh, another weak uh, relativist argument is that we ought to do what our individual society prescribes and that that is what is right. And this is what we call conventionalism. What they end up doing is basically uh, isolate themselves and say that they create their morality and that we ought not interfere with another culture's morality. And what this boils down to is that if society says what is right and wrong, then everything that the society determines turns out to be moral just by definition. And this reduces morality to law, or moral statements to power. And this idea, however, would condemn people like Martin Luther King, like I said earlier, or Gandhi, or Cory Tin Boom. Because moral reformers are ones who stand up in a society and say, hey, what everyone else is doing is wrong. They are opposing the moral, the quote, moral society. And by definition now, they must be viewed as being immoral. Rescuing Jews would have been immoral during the time and place that uh, for Cory Ten Boom because that's what she's doing. She was hiding the Jews in her basement. Now, if what is by definition moral being the society's consensus, if you go against that consensus as a minority, you are now considered immoral by definition. <clears throat> um, so, like I was saying, Cory Ten Boom uh, must be immoral because she violated the ruling dictates of that culture. So discussions about morality in the first place uh, would be incoherent and pointless if the relativists were right. So why are they discussing it, is my question. Why complain about the unjust legal system? <laughs> that kind of presumes that the legal systems ought to be just in the first place, or that you can even know what, quote, just is. And there is no way to morally improve, even, with a relativist viewpoint, which is pretty depressing. Only you can ha the only thing you can have is a change or a shift in morals. There can be no such thing as improvements. No value assessment like that exists in their view. Uh, next, I, I want to shift gears here and uh, take the time to say something about all of us as people. <clears throat> and that is that there is something I know about everyone on the planet. And you don't know that I know it. You know it, but you don't want other people to know about it. And that thing is that you have had, and still do have, a bad self-image. It is a darkness that you try to hide and you can't get rid of it. It's the universal human condition. We see something inside ourselves that we do not like. <laughs> that it's something in there that's all twisted and broken. Something evil down there does lurk, right? And we try to deny it, and not to show, what, show it to others, but we know something is wrong. And that that has a feeling and that feeling has a name <laughs> and the name of the feeling of our own moral brokenness is guilt we all feel guilty and the only people who don't feel guilty are sociopaths and so why do you suppose that we all feel guilty good question some say it, it's the culture that programs us to feel that way but that doesn't make sense because where did the society get it from and why is it assumed that the societal teachings are that powerful anyway. I mean, last time I checked, everyone was telling me that I'm okay and I'm a good person. You know, they're telling me that. And this has been my whole life. And that being the case, I should not feel the way I do. Or anyone else who is brought up in this culture and society. I mean, could it possibly be that the reason you feel guilty is because you are guilty? I mean, you ever 
Have you ever thought about that as being in the running of possibilities? So, society says I'm good, but yet I feel bad. Well, then they could say, well, you were raised a certain way, and that's the programming that has really got you tagged. But parental figures are not the only influence of society. Friends are often even more of a uh, potent influence than the parents are at times. I mean, adolescents many times think their parents are just retards and won't listen to them. The culture, also, which is diverse, you know, we got a melting pot society, is another major influence. So, there you see that how you were raised is filled with variety. And so, how you come to certain conclusions is the same and contains the same conditions as how most everyone else came to theirs. So I guess the only thing left to do is to weigh the evidences for who is right and who is wrong. So that whole objection of, you raised a certain way, that, that, that's kind of irre irrelevant. Everyone was raised some way. Someone uh, also once told me a similar thing, like, um, I mean, they said, that is westernized thinking, because I was telling them that Jesus was the only way, and I was telling them some other absolutistic ideas, you know, absolute truth and absolute morals, and they're like, oh, that's westernized thinking. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's mighty Eastern of you to say so. <laughs> Why don't you just say that you don't like my programming and that your programming is better? I mean, that would be more academically sound, in my opinion. Be a little bit more honest if you took that approach. Some people, uh, though, they suppress their guilt. They pretend that uh, they're good people, uh, you know. But if you're going to say that you're, quote, good, i got to ask one thing. What exactly makes someone good or evil? Now, most people, they'll say they're a good person because they do good things. Well, then doesn't doing evil make someone evil? I mean, you can't have it one way if you aren't willing to say it the other way around, with this being the standard. And uh, people don't like to be called liars or thieves, but, well, if you, you know, lied or stole, then wouldn't that make you so? If you do evil things, even if it's not as frequently as the other guy, or you didn't murder or do something really evil, wouldn't you be considered an evil person? Because they will have no problem saying that they're a good person when they do some good things. But what about when you do some evil things? Does that make you an evil person then? And here's what I do. Next time anyone says that, someone says that people are basically good at heart, just pull out your keys. That's what I do. I pull out my keys and jingle them right in front of their face. Because if people are basically good, we would not need keys at all. You know, we would have, like, push buttons on our ignitions in our car and... Our houses would not even, there would just be doors with no keyhole. But evidence is all around us that we are tainted to the core. I mean, just open the newspaper, you'll see. Everyone, most assuredly, uh, if you took a little analysis of your life, everyone has a huge rap sheet of crimes against God. And if you're, like, uh, let's do some simple math, if you're 20 years old and sinned only three times a day, which is far less than we actually do sin a day, it's pretty modest, that would equal 20,000 crimes over 20 years. Because 3 times 365 is a little over a grand, so a grand each year. 20 years is 20,000 crimes. Dude, the police would be all over you if you had committed even 20 crimes, let alone 20,000. So the truth be told, the more I am transformed by God to righteousness, the more I have the clarity to see how utterly depraved a person that I am. So if you're going around thinking you're such a good person, it's probably because you're least righteous. The more righteous you are, the more you're able to see how depraved you are. I mean, this doesn't mean that I get all depressed about it, like some things that were said in my mental health textbooks and nursing classes. They say, oh, you know, to have a self-image. Well, no, we're not supposed to be uh, having self-esteem. We're supposed to have Christ-esteem. I don't get depressed when I, when I see how depraved I am. You know... <laughs> This rather does the opposite, really. It gives me hope, because I know God is doing a work in me. Because I could never see the truth about myself on my own. The smart way to deal with the guilt I mentioned earlier is not through denial, but it's through forgiveness. And that is where Jesus comes in. Christianity speaks truthfully. What it teaches will resonate, and does resonate, with our deepest intuitions about the world in which we live. So number one, the universe is a moral universe with laws that apply to human beings. And number two, we have broken some of those laws many times. And we are guilty of moral crimes against our sovereign. This is the dual message of justice and love. 